Laura, I am so happy to see you again and so glad that you've decided to um, be interviewed for our SEPA website and our SEPA community. You have been called the Paul Krugman of Brazil. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more about this, but today I want to talk about your very important, um, really pathbreaking, I think, paper on how COVID is affecting um, Brazil. Um, you, you have pointed out that it has caused a lot of inequality and we're spotlighting the same trends in the United States. We're seeing that there's severe disparity in how the SARS-CoV-2 virus affects the disease path of COVID-19 based on race, class, and gender. And it seems as though you have found the same thing in Brazil. Can you tell us about how COVID-19 disease is affecting people in Brazil? Yes, well, uh, first of all, thank you, Teresa, uh, both for inviting me for the interview and, and to join SIPA again as a senior fellow. Uh, well, Brazil, uh, such as the US, has uh, very deep structural inequalities, uh, even deeper than the US, even though the US has been heading there, uh, let's say, in, in the past few decades. Um, and also to make it worse, Brazil is where was coming before the pandemic hit from a long period of economic crisis uh, and basically austerity since a deep 2015-16 recession. So Brazil was basically under stagnation and inequality was already increasing uh, in the country before the COVID-19 crisis actually uh, hit us. Um, so unemployment was very high, was above 11%. That, that's maybe a difference between what happened in the US and Brazil. Informality in the labor market was basically uh, touching half, almost half of the labor force. Uh, so this, of course, left us in a very fragile environment, both structural issues and uh, more short term, uh, say the past few years uh, path that, that we, we were taking, right? Um, and so, of course, I mean, uh, when, we, when we combine these issues with also a policy response that was very ineffective, both in the health front and in the economic mm -hmm. social uh, spheres, uh, so both Brazil and the U.S. have presidents who denied uh, scientific recommendations, who clashed with um, state local authorities who were, who were trying to implement lockdown measures. So all of these, of course, made us one of the global leaders and one of the global epicenters in the number of cases and in the number of deaths uh, in the, in, right at the beginning, I mean, after a few months, the pandemic started here. Mm -hmm. um, Brazil is still in a plateau that is basically mm -hmm. a, a permanent plateau in which we get close every day to a thousand people who died mm -hmm. uh, reportedly from, from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, this number may be even more underestimated here in Brazil than in the US given the lack of testing and other issues that, that have affected this. So of course, the situation is tragic and dramatic. And what we decided to do in this paper was to look into one of the dimensions there. Mm -hmm. um, basically, how inequality has affected in at all, in different aspects, how inequality has affected the number of infections and cases, and also uh, the other way around. So how, how did the pandemic affect inequality and how did the yeah. policy responses um, neutralize some aspects of these, um, these pressures on, mm -hmm. on inequality and poverty that the crisis has, has provoked. Mm -hmm. So this was basically the idea. Um, well, I really liked the paper. Uh, it was very easy to read. I recommend it to everybody. And by the way, we're speaking today. Um, today is September 10th, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about the beginning of the fall of 2020. What I liked about the paper is the efficiency of all the information that you packed into your social vulnerability index. Um, and I guess everybody, you know, every household in your sample is kind of assigned a vulnerability um, index. 
what question were you trying to answer when you constructed the index and what did you find? Okay, well, so basically the, the first idea was to look into the factors that may uh, leave people more, vulner more uh, vulnerable to infections by the virus. Okay. So before entering another side of the story, which is how access to health and other issues may yeah. lead to more severe cases of um, the disease, uh, here we, we started by looking, okay, what are the things that made people more subject to, to being yes. infected and, and less able to to um, stay at home and, 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 and things that may uh, make uh, people at the top of the distribution more protected in a situation like this, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what the virus did was to look into two dimensions of that. Uh, on the one side, working conditions. So for instance, how far do you need to travel and what is the mode of transportation to your work? Uh, the type of occupation that you have, is it considered by the government officially as an essential service uh, that had to continue during the, the, the first stage of the pandemic? Uh, mm -hmm. So that already in, entered in the index as something that leaves, uh, that increases vulnerability. Um, uh, and then the second part uh, looks into living conditions. So basically, what is the number of people that share a bedroom uh, in your house, right? Um, do you have access to piped water and sewage systems? Because this is a big issue in Brazil. We started with a problem. Uh, we started with all these recommendations. You should wash your hands, etc. And then uh, in the northeast of the country, you have uh, states and even in the southeast when you go to poor neighborhoods and peripheries in, in large uh, metropolitan areas you have a lot of houses that do not have access to clean water mm. uh, to pipe or, or to sewage and mm. of course that increases yeah. a lot the likelihood of uh, being infected so the the, the, the index ba basically synthesizes this information into mm -hmm. just one number and what we were able to find is that this index correlates strongly with the number of cases and death in that different is. resilient states. Mm -hmm. And we also show that this actually this correlation has increased mm -hmm. over time in Brazil mm -hmm. as these factors have played a larger role, given that the, the disease, the, the pandemic actually has started with the elites who were traveling abroad, etc., and then it was spreading. And while it was spreading, social, oh. social vulnerability started to play even more of a role in terms of this, at least when we look at these correlations, right? So this was an interesting uh, finding. And it happens up to a certain point. After the certain point, the correlation starts to fall, which mm -hmm. can also be due to the fact that the most vulnerable uh, people were, had such a large rate of infection that of course the, 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 the rate of infection started to fall over time. Um, so this is really, this was really striking. Um, and, and then of course we have another, another part of the paper, another section that actually looks at access to health and things that also play the role, but that are not related to this risk of infection, um, <laughs> but also play a role in terms of inequality and, and, and the COVID-19 um, effects right and uh so so we we looked into this data as well we we then start to look into uh how the crisis uh has affected this data and we found very strong racial and regional uh mm -hmm. aspects into social vulnerability and and the number of cases and death uh also the the hospitalizations and the use of ventilators as as you move into the most severe um, cases of of the disease you see how these inequalities play an even oh, larger even more right right with the with the rationing of medical supplies and care exactly. you know there's something in the paper that i didn't see quite at first that um what you said um, makes me um quite alarmed and that is that scientists and even the center for disease control have really emphasized that we're going to have more of these kinds of um, diseases 
because elites are traveling and coming, um, coming back home. So your paper and your index seems very valuable for the next pandemic and the next um, zoonic disease. Um, so it looks like it's going to be a workhorse of an index. Do you expect it to be? Yes, I actually, we were interested in looking at how these correlations between our index and the current pandemic evolves yeah. over time. We can update that. Um, it's also true that uh, we have observed something uh, that is quite surprising for us, which is um, average vulnerability as measured by this index um, is higher for, for non-whites than for yeah. whites in Brazil, even when we moved towards the top of the income distribution. So of course these differences yeah. fall when, as you mm -hmm. move from the bottom to the top, but they're still very high at the top, meaning yeah. that race still matters, even for say mm -hmm. rich people when it comes to income, right? Of course the top of the distribution mm -hmm. here is not exactly rich people necessarily, but uh, this this has shocked us a bit, and I think we we should probably look into this um, uh, more because, as you said, um, this pandemic has this double relationship to to inequality. Right? It's aggravated by it, and it also exacerbates it. And know. and so it, it leaves us in a in a in a situation in which we're even more vulnerable to another shock. Uh, and to another mm -hmm. pandemic or, or to even other types of uh, shocks that may hit us, right? So, so I think this is yeah, clearly an ongoing, an, an ongoing project, yes. Yeah, no, that's very exciting. We're finding independent racial effects across the board in the United States too that, that you know of, you know, that wealth and such cannot overcome it. Um, uh, it's a really great paper. Um, so what, what I see is that race certainly is an independent factor, um, you know, besides, you know, being poor, being correlated with race. What about gender? Um, what about women in this pandemic in Brazil? Well, uh, of course, when we look at the number of, of that, I mean, globally, we see that women are not showing uh, uh, as much uh, severity in terms of the of the cases, the women that are infected are not uh, as vulnerable to mm -hmm. dying as, as men, right? This is, this is clear everywhere. But if you look at the rates, uh, the vulnerability to infection and, mm -hmm. and, other, and the ec other economic effects of the crisis, their gender clearly shows up as well as an important factor. Uh, for these inequalities. So basically women are more employed in services and yeah. these actors that are both vulnerable to, to being exposed to the, to the virus and also who are vulnerable to job losses and income losses um, in, in, in the current context, right? So um, we, we have observed an increase in wage inequality. So labor income became uh, more unequally distributed after the shock, after the pandemic shock, even though a program, a cash relief program that was approved by Congress here in Brazil during the pandemic really was able, it was a substantial uh, program, uh, an income transfer that was able to uh, neutralize the increase in, uh, in inequality uh, fully uh, during the period in which it was implemented. We don't know, actually we know that it, will, it won't last, uh, but in any case, wage inequalities have increased and these wage inequalities have to do with the fact that sectors that employ uh, lower skilled workers were exactly the ones most affected by, by the measures that the responses and also the crisis itself. And yeah. so, um, of course, women uh, tend to pay a higher price. And that's not even to speak, because this we don't treat in our paper, of the other effects, right? Women who um, are having to mm -hmm. deal with uh, care together with their work and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and are exiting the labor force. And this is also clear in Brazil. I've seen data on it already. Uh, yeah. I think this is a global phenomenon, yes. Yeah, it is global. It is, yeah, in, in, it's happening in the United States. We're calling it a she recession, you know, where women are much more uh, vulnerable to, to lay off, much more vulnerable to have to do more unpaid work. 
yes. um, much more pressure to quit work um, to take care of the children who are at home who aren't in schools, both in Brazil and the U.S. Um, as the disease progresses in Brazil, it, you've already told us that you're getting some herd immunity, you know, in some um, sectors. Um, but I'm gleaning from your comments in your paper that the social inequality caused by the special circumstances of this disease won't go away, that somehow it's building in some permanent structural inequalities. Can you expand more on that, how the disease itself is exacerbating or making worse the inequalities that were already there? Yes. Um, well, um, basically, Brazilian, is, Brazilian GDP, uh, of course, is falling uh, dramatically, as everywhere else. We were able to attenuate a little bit this fall because of the cash relief program. As I said, it's something that it basically touched 70 million Brazilians. Uh, yeah. It's huge. It, it avoided an income loss for the bottom half, half of the population. It wasn't yeah. an initiative of the government. Right. It was uh, basically pressure of civil, civil society on Congress that was able to approve it. But then, of course, when we look at the data, uh, we have to separate what is the effect on the labor market from the effect on total income, because the cash relief program is helping to prevent the rise in inequality at the moment. But the, the value that people, the amounts that people are receiving is already being cut by half from September on until December. And then in January, this is over and we're back to austerity. So, of course, um, this, uh, this inequality that we're seeing in the labor market will also appear yeah. in, in the total uh, income data uh, in next year, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, poverty levels were also very reduced due to the cash relief mm. program. Um, uh, but then that's also going to show up when this ends, right? And, and in fact, the government has already announced its budget for next year and we're back to basically very strict fiscal rules. We have a spending ceiling. Uh, there are gonna be budget cuts in several important areas, including health. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and there's no space whatsoever for uh, expanding social protection, uh, continuing at least an intermediate type of uh, social benefits that could be in between what we have now with the cash relief and what, what we had before uh, with the existing programs. Nothing of that is, is yeah. possible given our prospects, prospects yeah. in, the, in the future budget. So yes, we will see a rise in inequality and of course that rise in inequality will have a gender and a racial dimension. Um, yeah. as it's usually the case. And what's even more uh, tragic is that um, the, 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 the inequality was already increasing in Brazil yeah. uh, since 2015. We had a reduction in, in inequality mm. in the 2000s yeah. uh, when the commodity price boom uh, was there and, and distributive policies have been made. Uh, but this is clearly back and we're basically losing very fast all the gains mm. uh, in terms, especially in terms of a reduction in wage inequality that we had in the 2000s. Got it. Yeah, so post-vaccine, you're going um, back to pre-disease pre um, policies that are creating the inequality. It's not just the condition of Brazil and your, and your population, it's policies that are creating um, the inequality and nothing about the disease policies have even addressed those structural issues. Um, yeah, it looks very similar um, to the United yeah. States. Um, I lo would love to know more about your co-authors because you didn't write this paper like many of us don't write our papers by ourselves. Can you tell me more about your co-authors? Of course, yes. So uh, basically there, there, there are two Brazilian economists, uh, Luisa Nassif Pires, who is also a New School alumna who uh, have I have worked with Luisa before she even joined her PhD at the New School. Uh, yeah. I worked with her previously in, in Brazil. 
uh, both at the Federal University of Rio and at, uh, when I took my first job as assistant professor, she, she actually worked with me on a research project uh, uh, at the Sao Paulo School of Economics. She's now a researcher at the Levy Institute in upstate New York, and she had done work, similar work, uh, for the U.S. So she had mm -hmm. published a paper on social vulnerability, inequality, and COVID-19 uh, in the U.S. I, I read the paper and I said, okay, Luisa, we should probably do that for Brazil. Uh, inequalities are, are mm -hmm. even um, deeper in Brazil. We may be able to see yeah. even stronger results. Um, and so that's, that's basically uh, how the paper uh, came to, to exist. And Eduardo uh, Havet, who is a, 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 who is a previous student of mine, he, he was actually a master's uh, student. I, I supervised his uh, thesis uh, on wealth inequalities in Brazil. So he's someone who worked on the topic. And he's now starting his PhD at the American University in Washington, DC. Oh, well, nice. he's, not, he's still not in Washington because he's, he was prevented uh, from the crisis, but he's already uh, taking classes uh, there, and we invited him to to join. Uh, mm. yeah. um, this just points out how generous and generative you were when you were um, at the New School as a, as a student, Laura. Always generous, looking out for people to build them up. Um, I think you in, in improve the lives of everybody you touch, it seems. And I certainly can see it in this dimension um, when you work with younger people. Uh, how is your own work shaping up? What does what your intellectual life look like in the next five years? Uh, that's a difficult question. I mean, what's, what's happened with me since I finished the, the PhD at the new school is that I went uh, more and more towards this intersection between macroeconomics, which was my, um, basically is my field, my major field, and inequality, right? And I'm turning mm -hmm. more empirical, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. than I was before. I was doing more theoretical work. So mm -hmm. I'm, in this, I'm in this macro, I, 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 I say that I'm doing macroeconomics of inequality, which I'm not even sure it's a field, <laughs> uh, but it should be. It should I think you be. just made one up, right? And, and, and this is really what, where my research has been, has been focused since then, uh, which includes topics such as uh, the distributive impacts of fiscal policy, the relationship between unemployment and inequality, yeah. the impact of inequality on consumption and, and fiscal multipliers mm -hmm. and so on. So this is really what I, what I want to do in terms of research is get more and more there. I want to maybe even put together things that include microeconometrics and mm -hmm. macroeconomic mm -hmm. uh, impact and analysis. Uh, I'm trying to push my students to go there too. Yeah. Uh, so this is where I want to be in terms of research. I've, I've just created a research group at the university mm -hmm. that I, is actually has uh, other two professors. One of them is another new school alum, Fernando Rujitsky. Oh, yeah. Right. He's now my colleague. He's also in this group. Uh, Gilberto Tadeu Lima, who is uh, a macroeconomist, is also in this group. We have several students there and we're starting to do some projects. And now, I'm now doing something for the ILO uh, mm -hmm. on the multiplier effects of social benefits. Um, and we're starting other things. We just got a, a, a grant from Open Society Foundation for uh, mm. um, basically proposals for a green and inclusive economic recovery from COVID-19. So uh, this is really exciting in terms of uh, the work environment to actually get people working with me. I like this team type of, uh, of work. But then... Yes. I mean, on the other side, I have also engaged a lot in, in the public debate in, in Brazil, outside of the university in the past few years. Uh, it started when I started to write weekly for the largest uh, Brazilian newspaper. I did that for several years. And that sort of brought me another side of, of being an economist, which is also trying to communicate economics for a more general audience. And I came to like that a lot, which means I, I'm, I'm also writing books and trying to, so I, I actually published one during the pandemic on the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis and the roles of the state during this crisis. 
uh, mm -hmm. is my latest uh, book. So I, I'm, I'm more and more trying to speak to, to more people as well outside of, uh, of academia. And I feel that uh, that's also something I'll always be doing. Uh, it's in a way it has a purpose, which is uh, to bring society to the economic debate, which is always so okay. technical and, and pushes people away. And I feel that that's also part of the problem in terms of why our policies uh, decided um, behind doors and, 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 and with this apparent technical uh, explanation with no possible alternatives and, and in a way communicating, right. bringing people to, to the debate uh, is also something that, that I think may help and that I like to do and that I'm learning to do. It's not easy. Economists were trained to speak in a certain way uh, yeah. that basically pushes people away and, and, and it's a learning process to learn how to, to even say things and, and make ourselves uh, understandable. So. Oh, I, um, Laura, it's so exciting. I like the two phrases you said, just to wrap up, is that you are attempting to almost change your own speech to make sure that society is brought into the technical discussions of, of economics. And the other um, scholarly thing that you said that I think has a future, and I will encourage and help in any way I can to make um, the macroeconomics of inequality, a subcode under the Journal of Economic yes. Literature code. I mean, that is a, how we classify our knowledge as a political process. Um, we have a kind of economist here, Derek Hamilton, also a senior fellow, um, a fellow of yours now, a colleague of yours, Derek Hamilton, who um, lobbied the economics profession to have a subcode called economic stratification. So it's not, it's not unreachable, and I think it's very important um, for the profession. So both you're serving society and you're also serving our profession, which of course is part of our society. I really appreciate the time that you've taken to talk about your paper and to the broader project. Thank you so much, Teresa. It was great speaking to you. Thank you.